evening organized by Sri Lanka College of Specialist Family Physicians. The topic today is autism and attention deficit, what to do in primary care. I would like to most cordially invite Dr. Malkanti Gadhena, President of Sri Lanka College of Spe Specialist Family Physician, to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Over to you, madam. But shall I start? Yes, madam. You can. Okay. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, uh, here, I'm Dr. Malkanti Dalpena, the president for the Sri Lanka College of uh, Specialist Family Physician. I would like to welcome you all uh, um, with my warm wishes today to the monthly CPD program of our college hosted by the Sri Lanka College of Specialist Family Physicians. So uh, before we commence, um, I would like to uh, shed some uh, the, you know, the light on our college CPD programs initiatives, which we are conducting for last you know, the many months. It's in a basis of two weeks basis. So with the, the, that is conducted by two weekly by one of our the senior consultants and sharing the knowledge with the registrars and other medical officers who need that. And as well as, you know, in monthly we invite outside resource person of uh, different specialties in order to provide uh, the knowledge in uh, the depth for our uh, the medical professionals as well as especially for our registrars which we need to uh, expand their knowledge for the better patient management. So today, I thank you very much for organizing this meeting for our junior, you know, the young juniors, uh, and as usual. And today is a special day for us because our guest speaker for today is Professor Muru Chandudasa. He's the the, the only professor in you know, the child and adolescent psychiatry in Sri Lanka now. And uh, not only that, he is, you know, the consultant psychiatrist, as well as he's a senior lecturer in the University of Kalani. So I know that you are having Professor Nuru. You are mostly welcome to our, you know, the college session, the academic uh, CPD programs today. And I know that you are having enough busy schedules. Uh, for I am so grateful for your commitment today. You have done on the specialist, the, the family physicians college. So now, uh, thanking very much for you. And I wish you all the very best for the Professor Nuru Chandradasa for your future endeavors. And you know, the, please share your expert knowledge with our mother. Uh, the great you know the audience now we are having today more than 100 more than 100 participants and i invite you know the uh, the uh, dr vimarsh the registrar to the conduct the program you know the especially you know the uh, you know the introducing our it's a very very important guest speaker to the audience today thank you very much and wish you all the very best it's over to you vimarsh Many thanks, madam. Uh, like uh, Dr. Uh, Malkanti Kalhena correctly in, uh, said, uh, today's guest speaker is Professor Miru Chandradasa. He is the head of the Department of Psychiatry at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. He is also the only child and adolescent psychiatrist attached to a medical faculty in our country. Professor Chandradasa has published 100 peer-reviewed journal articles, including 72 Scopus indexed publications. So before I hand over uh, tonight's proceedings uh, to our guest speaker, let me go over a few housekeeping rules. Kindly keep your microphones muted throughout the session. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to type them in the chat box. We'll address them at the end of the session. Towards the end of the lecture, we will post a link in the chat box. Kindly fill it out. Please note that attending the lecture for a minimum of 45 minutes and completing this form is mandatory to obtain the certificate of participation. 
attendance for at least 45 minutes will earn you one CPD point. Please rename yourself now with the name, with your name, as it should appear on the certificate. Professor Chandadasa, over to you, sir. Good evening. As today we are going to discuss about uh, how to detect uh, possible autism spectrum disorder in children and possible attention deficit in children in primary care and what can we do in the primary care. So let us start with uh, autism spectrum disorder. So autism spectrum disorder is one of the neurodevelopmental disorders other neurodevelopmental disorders we commonly see include attention deficit hyperactivity, tick disorders, intellectual disability, and specific learning disorders or dyslexia. Neurodevelopmental disorders mean a certain neural network in the brain has delayed maturation, so certain functions of the cortex are delayed. In autism, the function that is delayed is understanding emotions and thoughts in others so the social communication is delayed in autism the symptoms fall into two categories the first category is called deficits in social communication so under this category there are three symptoms that we need to recognize in children adolescents and sometimes in adults First being that uh, they find it hard to understand emotions in others so they don't reciprocate when they understand or they, when they see an emotion in another person. Secondly, they may have problems in nonverbal communication. So we communicate in words, we communicate with facial expressions, gestures, However, in children with autism, sometimes this nonverbal communication, such as sustained meaningful eye contact, may not be there, or their body uh, gestures or facial expressions may not be appropriate. The third symptom in the first category being difficulty in establishing relationships. So kids, when they go to nursery, they may not interact with other kids as usual and they may be isolated. When they are teens, it may be hard for them to find real life friends and they may resort to online games and having only online friends. In the second category, there are four symptoms. Out of these four symptoms, the first being either repetitive movements or repetitive speech or words. Sometimes they spin around, sometimes they rock when they are sitting, sometimes they utter the same word or sound. So these kind of repetitiveness, which are called either motor stereotypy or verbal stereotypy, are indicative of autism spectrum disorder. One of the characteristic verbal stereotypy would be echolalia, where the child repeats what you say. If you ask from the child, what's your name? The child will say, what's your name? Sometimes this echolalia is immediate. They immediately repeat what you say. Sometimes it is delayed. For example, they may repeat something they have heard a while ago. The second symptom in the second category is wanting to do the things same way. Sometimes they may want to have the same food, same clothes, same type of seating, that kind of thing. If it is changed, they may be angry, irritable, or annoyed. For example, sometimes they may get used to one class teacher. If that class teacher goes on leave, they may find it hard to get adjusted to the new person. The third symptom in the second category is they may have fixated interest. For example, a 13-year-old teenage boy may usually talk about cricket, girls, studies, songs, other things they like. But a boy sometimes 
who may have autism spectrum disorder may be talking about one topic only. For example, they may talk about the solar system, stars, universe, galaxy. So the other boys may not connect with him because he always talk about the same topic. The final symptom in the second category is sensory integration abdominities. Sometimes some sensors are felt too much. For example, if you take the child outside, if a sound of a motorbike or sound of the blender is too much and heard in high amplitude in a certain frequency, they may be distressed and they may close their ears. Sometimes some sensors are felt less than usual. Sometimes uh, the nursery teacher would say, I, I, it's very hard for me to keep this child in the classroom because he always wants to run out and play with water or play with sand. So they want to uh, feel certain sensations more than usual. So in order to diagnose autism, the first three criteria in the first category should be there and two out of four in the same category should be there over about six months and should not be due to any other child psychiatric disorder like intellectual disability. Let's look at these symptoms in a more deeper manner. If you want to understand autism, one of the great examples is the character played by Mr. Jim Parson as Dr. Sheldon Cooper. So if you have watched Big Bang Theory, one of the most well-known sitcoms in the world, this character of Sheldon Cooper, he's a neurophysicist with very high IQ and a set of friends. His character, if you know, it's a, a reasonable depiction of high-functioning autism spectrum disorder. So who are high-functioning autism people? So persons with autism spectrum disorder, if they have normal language, normal low higher than average intelligence, we call them high functioning autism uh, person. So uh, let's see uh, how this character is built up in this famous sitcom of Big Bang Theory. Every Saturday since we've lived in this apartment, I have awakened at 6.15, poured myself a bowl of cereal, added a quarter cup of 2% milk, sat on this end of this couch, turned on BBC America, and watched Doctor Who. <laughs> and he's still sleeping. So they Every would Saturday like to do the same, in the same day again and again. Penny. Sometimes they do the Penny. same thing again and again Penny. and have the What's up, Buttercup? Boom. You have to get rid of the chair. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Penny, Penny, uh, initial here to acknowledge that you've returned your key. <laughs> See? Oh, yes. As my future neighbor, I'd like you to have a key. Well, enjoy your... So he's changing his apartment, so he doesn't like changes, so he's... Uh, asking his uh, roommate to uh, uh, sign a contract, even though he's his friend. So he, they don't like changes. A big evening. Penny, I realize you're also on your own tonight. So if at some point you find yourself with nothing to do, please do not disturb me. <laughs> Have fun. Have you so they find it hard to socialize and sharing emotions, uh, doing collaborative work may be a little bit hard. Have you ever considered trying to do something useful? <laughs> Perhaps reading to the elderly? Excuse me? Yeah, but not your books. It's something they might enjoy. I'm leaving. So they are at times rude because they don't uh, have the same empathetic response. So they may say things that are hurtful. You can't leave. I need you. You do? Yes. You're my ride. <laughs> so that is his girlfriend, a biologist, another very intelligent person. So at the time, he says, I need you. You may think like he's actually caring, 
but he says, you are my ride, you are my driver. I need to get back home. If you go, I can't get, go home. Okay, Sheldon, Sheldon, look, I am scared and in a lot of pain. Could you please take a break from being you for just a minute and try being, I don't know, comforting? I'm sorry. They're there. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. Sheldon's here. Thanks, that's much better. Uh, so not that they care, they care, they love people, they like to share emotions, but showing emotions is a bit hard. So even though this character is uh, played in a sort of like a, a funny way, it shows that at times they are... Uh, facial expressions and body uh, postures may be awkward and odd for other people. Here. <laughs> Leonard, look, Sheldon's hugging me. What is it about trains that you like so much? An interesting question. When I was a child, life was confusing and chaotic for me, and trains represented order. I could line them up, categorize them, control them. I guess you could say that they gave me a sense of calm in a world that didn't. That's lovely, Sheldon. So, uh, some people with autism spectrum disorder like to collect things and order things in a certain way. So it gives them a sense of control, as just mentioned here. Sheldon? <laughs> yes? Listen, they're kind of getting busy in the living room, and I was wondering if I could hang out in here for a while. Well, I suppose. Come in. I'll sleep in Leonard's room. Good night. So sometimes for them, reading nonverbal cues uh, can be hard. So the other person may have indicated certain messages, but for them, reading other, patient, other person's nonverbal cues could be hard. You know, you fanboys are unbelievable. Do you think you can just ring my doorbell anytime you want? I mean, why don't you just come on in and watch the Lakers game with me? Well, I'm not much of a sports fan, but thank you. You came into my apartment last night while I was sleeping? Yes, but only to clean. But really more to organize. You're not actually dirty, per se. Give me back my key. I'm very, very sorry. Do you understand how creepy this is? Oh, yes, we discussed it at length last night. In my apartment, while I was sleeping. And snoring. And that's probably just a sinus infection. But it could be sleep apnea. You might want to see an otolaryngologist. <laughs> the throat doctor. And what kind of doctor removes shoes from asses? Depending on the depth, that's either a <laughs> proctologist or a general surgeon. So sometimes the social meaning of language, so they are intelligent, they can understand the meaning of single words, but the holistic meaning or the pragmatics may be hard and sarcasm may not be understood. So what are these symptoms? Uh, they, it may be hard for them to establish friendships, even though uh, language delay is not one of the criteria. Many children with autism spectrum disorder can have language delay, but some children do not have any language problems. Uh, they may be uh, distressed by certain sensations. When using toys, especially toy cars, they may like to turn the wheels rather than play it as a toy car. Sometimes they may like certain colors or textures. 
and at times uh, they may not connect with the environment they are so they may be unaware and maybe have inappropriate behavior and high faculty because they don't understand how to behave in that circumstance sometimes they do not like being touched and they at times like to collect certain things and some of them have poor sustained meaningful eye contact so in a busy clinic in primary care if you can ask only one question from a child or a parent that has come to you for any other reason like a respiratory tract infection but you can ask one question is is your child lining up toys at home and when these lines are broken or changed does the child get distressed and angry so lining up toys is one of the characteristic symptoms you can ask in a short duration if you are running uh, you don't have if, if you don't have enough time right let's look at a, a child with autism spectrum disorder and try to understand how they present in primary care he has an intense yeah. interest in the so this is the therapist who's sitting close to the child and writing on the book and this child has autism spectrum disorder he has a toy phone uh, one good thing about here is he has pretend play because in autism developing pretend play is difficult but this child has pretend play however the joy of the toy phone is not shared with the therapist you know toddlers they like to share the joy the person sitting behind the child is the mother even though the toy phone is so interesting he doesn't share it with mother doesn't ask for help and do it by himself so there's no interaction or collaboration with the mother or the therapist let's see what the mother does so mother tries to get his sustained meaningful eye contact but it's so hard he doesn't give eye contact and it's hard to engage with him when she tickles him he enjoys it he laughs but still doesn't connect emotionally with her so these are the features you can ask easily from a mother who brings a toddler to you for any any medical reason so as primary care physicians if a child do not respond to their name by one year please immediately refer if they are not pointing at an object like a cat or a bird with interest at one year and two months please refer if one and a half years 18 months they are not playing pretend games like they are pretending to drink water from a empty cup they are pretending to make a call to dad uh, just holding a block to their ear please refer okay let's look at another video focusing on the restricted repetitive behavior that i spoke in the second category of symptoms in autism spectrum disorder this child has autism spectrum disorder the therapy is blowing soap bubbles child is very interested in the soap bubbles but do not look at the face of the therapist the therapist calls his name there's no response to child's name and when the finger is pointed the child looks at the finger but not at the direction so and there was if you can see again look closely the eyes hand flapping a motor stereotype a repetitive motor movement that could be seen in many neurodevelopmental disorders including autism spectrum disorder so no sustained meaningful eye contact not reading other person's nonverbal communication and hand flapping which is a motor stereotype So how do we manage autism spectrum disorder First thing is telling the parents of the diagnosis So if the parent is willing to go and meet a child psychiatrist things may be easier for you but if they are not you may have to give them a brief idea what autism spectrum disorder in and what they need to do 
So autism spectrum disorder is a disorder due to there's a delay in the development of certain neural networks related to communicating with other people. So children with autism know that they can't speak, they don't want to speak because they enjoy being with themselves rather than communicating and connecting with other people. And always you need to look into parents' well-being as well. The main mode of management for autism spectrum disorder is behavioral therapy. We call this behavioral therapy early intensive behavioral interventions because we do not have adequate number of behavioral therapists in Sri Lanka. What we do is we train the parents to do home-based interventions. So if the child is seen by a child psychiatrist, the parents educated on behavioral interventions as a primary care physicians, you can see whether the parents are following them up. We will refer kids with certain deficits for other uh, therapies as well. If the child has speech and language delay, we will refer the child for a speech and language therapist. If the child has sensory processing abnormalities like closing ears for loud noises, wanting to touch the sand all the time, we may refer for occupational therapist. And if there are learning problems, we will refer to an educational therapist. In selected cases, the child psychiatrist may prescribe medications for certain problems. No medication can uh, correct autistic symptoms. However, let's say a child with autism who can be improved but does not sit for speech and language therapy or does not sit in the nursery and runs away from the class or is aggressive to other children. In those situations, a selected medications may be given for a short period for child to improve concentration, attention, so the child can obtain necessary therapy and necessary academic support. If the medication is not given, sometimes the child may miss essential therapy sessions and essential academic time, delaying their recovery. So at times, uh, selected medications may be given while balancing a possible a problems so that they can we can improve them with good behavioral interventions. So in the primary care, as primary care physicians and family physicians, what are the essential things you need to do? Tell the parents that this is a neurodevelopmental disorder and there's a delay in development of certain neural networks and tell them the diagnosis is lifelong. However, with good early interventions, lot of deficits can be recovered. Sometimes some kids recover so fast, it is hard to understand whether they had autism and they integrate with society very well. Look into parents' well-being because all parents, when a child is born, they wish for a normal, a typically developing child so sometimes they may be depressed, distressed, sad, angry. Sometimes they are in a denial. Sometimes when we say your child has autism, they say you are wrong. I will go to another doctor. So they are angry. They are angry with us. They are angry with themselves. They feel they may have a guilt thinking that. So they may have this misinterpretation. They may think that uh, because they gave the child the smartphone to watch cartoon, it caused autism. There's nothing like that. Uh, screens do not cause autism uh, and uh, watching cartoons or uh, phones do not cause autism. So they may have a guilt. It may have induced autism, which is wrong. So you need to look into their mental well-being as well. If the parents are willing, emphasize the need to go and meet a child psychiatrist because there are only few of us. If it is not possible to travel far, encourage the parent to go to a psychiatrist. Consultant psychiatrists are based in all districts in the country and they are quite busy with uh, heavy workloads, but still most of them conduct child and adolescent clinics for the benefit of children. Obviously, if the parents go to the child psychiatrist, then your work is easier. That is following up after the child psychiatrist is seen. 
even if they don't go to the child psychiatrist, still help them. One of the biggest things you have to say is stop electronic device use. That means electronic device use is zero. That means no news when the child is away. Because the screens are so attractive, colorful, and because of that, child's language may not develop properly. Because when you are trying to teach someone to communicate their emotions, when there's a huge attractive distraction, it further delays. If they have not sought proper consultation, at least tell them to increase interactive play at home. Sit at the child's eye level and play with them, improving joint attention. Joint attention means the child parent is concentrating on the same thing, same play thing, and they are understanding they are doing it together. So uh, have a place at home uh, with few toys. If a toy is more interesting than you, we need to get rid of that toy. Because the most interesting thing in that room should be the parent. It can be the grandparent, mother, father, aunt, uncle, who is willing to help. So we say if uh, that kind of intense behavioral interventions can be done three to four hours per day, like 40 hours per week, there's a chance of recovery. Obviously, if they are willing to see a child psychiatrist, you should direct to appropriate places. So improving interactive play, encouraging joint attention, doing the same play, child understanding the parent also uh, concentrating the same play is the key to improving deficits in autism spectrum disorder. Right, let's move to the second part of my session. What to do in primary care for attention deficit? Please take a few minutes to read this case example. So Chanul is studying in grade five. He's 10 years old. His father is a businessman. Mother is an accountant. So mother has perfectionist traits where she's methodical, punctual, and always accept high stand of academic work. She would say, erase, the, erase your handwriting, write it in a proper way. So sometimes the child is afraid of the mother because she always corrects it. On the other hand, the father is quite relaxed, mostly not at home, at his work, and does not pay much attention to his academic work. Chanul doesn't have good self-esteem, so starting a friendship is hard. Even though he's not disturbing anyone, uh, he's quite afraid to talk to a new friend. So he doesn't have friends, says everyone his friend. So when uh, everyone in so when they come to see the child psychiatrist it appears that he's a bit scared of the mother and stays close to the father holding his hand and the teacher has repeatedly told the parents that there are so many careless mistakes and at home in order to make him do school work the mother has to stay with him otherwise he get distracted so uh, father says because uh, he's not interested in scholarship and he says he was also like this when he was small and they say they are not willing to pressurize tunnel for academic work which is probably not the uh, truth they are telling. So here this is a classical presentation of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder inattentive subtype sometimes missed by certain professional. 
because there is no hyperactivity here, still this meets the criteria for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So let's try to understand what is what is attention. So this is a video of a group of children. Okay, I'll come to that later. Right. Okay, let's try to understand what is selective attention. There are three memory systems in our in our mind: sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Information we hear and see goes to the sensory memory and lasts only few seconds. When we pay selective attention only, that goes to the short-term memory and we understand things. In attention deficit disorder, selective focusing, selective attention is impaired. So only part of the information we hear or see goes to the short-term memory. When information goes to short-term memory, still they will be lost within few minutes to hours. So you need to read it again within few days or few hours. Then only it goes to the long-term memory. But when you have attention deficit, you can't sit still and focus on things and you do not complete stuff. So this affects the information processing and transfer. So uh, that leads to deterioration of academic work. So in primary care, they will come and say, my child is so fidgety running around. He falls and have frequent injuries. Doesn't listen to instructions. That's the opposite of what is asked. I taught him this lesson, but he cannot remember what I taught him last week. If you want to do something, you have to tell the same thing 10 times and they will say, I will do it later, not now. And sometimes the parent will say they are addicted to screens because, because their attention span is shorter. Focusing on longer activities like writing letters is super boring for them. So they like fast moving things like the screens, like the cartoons, like the video games. So let's listen to a most famous person who has attention deficit disorder. What's up guys, I'm Michael Phelps. Uh, I'm an Olympic champion and I have ADHD. Uh, growing up, I, I was somebody who was always constantly bouncing off the wall. I could never sit still. Um, if I could go back in time and tell my younger self something, I, I would tell him to, to believe what's in his heart and never ever give up. Um, you know, that's something that, that I've lived with my whole entire life and, and will continue to live with. Uh, it's been something that's changed my life um, since the beginning. Uh, you know, I think, you know, I think the biggest thing for me, once I found that it was okay to talk to somebody and, and, and seek help, um, I think that's something that, that has changed my life forever and, and now I'm able to live life to its fullest. Um, I mean, I had kids who you know, we were all in the same class and teachers would treat them differently than they would treat me. Um, I had a teacher tell me that I would never amount to anything and I would never be successful. Um, so it was a challenge and it was a struggle, but for me, it was something I'm thankful happened and, and I'm thankful that I am how I am. Uh, I look at myself every day and I'm so, so proud and so happy of, of who I am and who I've been able to become. So if you know Michael Phelps, so Sri Lanka has, as far as I know, has won two Olympic medals, Duncan White, silver, Susantika Jayatinya, bronze first, then converted to silver. However, Michael Phelps alone, I think, has 28 Olympic gold medals, more than 20, uh, 28 Olympic medals and more than 20 gold medals by himself. So he's considered the greatest athlete of all time or the greatest swimmer of all time. He used to have ADHD as a child. Teachers said, you will not amount to anything. But with proper guidance and treatment, he went on to become one of the greatest athletes of all time. So like autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity is also a neurodevelopmental disorder. Like autism, it is more common among boys compared to girls. 
However, autism is only up to 1% of the population, but attention deficit amounts to 7%. So in child psychiatric practice, ADHD is the vast bigger problem compared to autism. However, anxiety disorders and depression have even higher prevalences. So in attention deficit hyperactivity, the symptoms fall into two categories. The first category is inattentive category. There are nine symptoms. The parents will say they are very careless. They do not complete things. They do not like activities that require time. Their books are empty at times. In their question papers, they have started writing, missed certain sections, easy questions. They know if you ask, ask them verbally, they know the answer, but they have not written the answer. And they do stuff and they get distracted and they forget what they teach you. If there are six out of nine of these symptoms, the child have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, inattentive type. Even so, if the child even doesn't have hyperactivity, inattention alone is enough to diagnose. In the other category, there are hyperactivity and impulsive symptoms. So the child can't stay sit, always leave in the seat, walking in the class, always like has a lot of energy and running around. They may talk too much. They can't wait for the question to be finished. They want to answer faster. They can't wait for their turn and they may disturb, especially if the parents are on a call. They may come and disturb if the parents are having a conversation. They may disturb them and intrude you, intrusive. So these are symptoms. If the child has six symptoms out of these nine, child has the attention deficit hyperactivity, hyperactivity type of disorder. Sometimes some kids have only inattention. Some kids have only hyperactivity. Some have both symptom types. The symptom should be there for about more than six months and should be inconsistent with the developmental level and should be seen at two settings. Should be at school, should be at home. And in adults and adolescents, five symptoms in one category is enough for the diagnosis. Especially in girls, sometimes they do not show hyperactivity. They are not disturbing, they are not aggressive but they are not completing work and they easily get distracted. Because of that, easily attention deficit hyperactivity is missed in girls. If you don't treat on time, the academic deterioration could occur. It's difficult to maintain the same friends because they get scolded by many. They have low self-esteem. They are impulsive and not so careful. They get into injuries. They are present with foreign bodies and when they are older, they may get into substance use because they are so bored and they want to do always exciting things. They drive fast, meet with road traffic accidents, get into fights and get into conflicts. What happens in attention deficit disorder? So the neural networks connecting the midbrain and the cortex controls our attention and concentration. Certain amount of dopamine and norepinephrine are required in the synapse to maintain concentration. However, if the dopamine transporter in the presynaptic neuron is working too much, there may not be adequate dopamine to induce adequate concentration for a task. So when there's inadequate dopamine, you are distracted or hyperactive. So that is how a one-way attention deficit and hyperactivity occurs. Another way is the dopamine transporter is all right. There's adequate dopamine. However, the receptors that signals the message is not functioning well. So because of that, still, distraction, poor concentration could occur. So uh, usually when they are small, they may be hyperactive, but when they are bigger, their hyperactivity reduces. So however, their inattention remains. So the teachers frequently say 
don't treat this child because I have seen an older child who was hyperactivity when he was in my class. Now he is not. However, even though hyperactivity goes down, inattention remains. So treatment is necessary. How do we treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? First thing is providing psychoeducation to the parents. If they are willing to meet a child psychiatrist, your work is easier. If not, what you have to say is the neural networks or the brain regions that control focusing on a task are working slowly. Because of that, they cannot keep the concentration at a task. Because they get distracted, they do not like to engage in longer activities and over time when they grow older they lose motivation to study even though they are highly intelligent they don't like to spend uh, their time on uh, reading books so they lose interest so they still they may be highly interested in reading story books that doesn't mean they have good concentration because it is required for quite a boring task that requires repetition because a novel or a storybook is quite interesting and you can imagine a lot of things. Some kids with attention deficit read books for a long time. That is only storybooks. So you have to say there is evidence-based treatment and you need to seek support. And you can write a letter to the school as a family physician telling that this is an attention deficit problem, not a fault of the child. Please don't punish the child. Keep the child in the front row and help the child recover by improving his academic work, which I will mention in a while. In attention deficit disorder, because it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, the international guidelines, evidence from all around the world says that there is a need to give medications. The medications given for ADHD are very safe and can be taken for some time. So usually uh, about 80% of children recover in their mid-adolescence. So a couple of years of treatment may help them to uh, easily improve their academic work and move on with their life. Apart from medications, we need to have their behavioral support and educational support and support at school. So what are the... Uh, Apart from medication, what are the supports we can give to a child with attention deficit hyperactivity? It has three approaches, support for the child, support for the parent, support at school. For the child, there are certain activities that improve concentration. For example, age appropriate uh, coloring schemes where the child has to sit and color each part to make a holistic picture. Or there may be certain play activities like puncher them email. So they have to wait for their turn to improve concentration. Second approach, parental skills training. Parents need to give one-to-one -one attention at home, find a non-distractable environment, uh, remove distractions like don't ask the child to sit closer to a corridor or a window. Uh, make them face a light colored wall and allow give them shorter tasks and when they complete a shorter task, face them and encourage them using a reward scheme. At school, uh, you can tell the teacher, please ask the child to sit in the front row, not at the teacher's desk, that is discrimination, only at the front row between two supportive peers. When you ask the other children to do the whole lesson, tell this child to do two questions. When they complete the two questions, praise them and ask them to do the next two. Give frequent reminders when they complete stuff, give them praise and they will do well. And when they complete tasks, you can devote them maybe with some extra play time or some discuss pre negotiated rewards from the parents. So at home, uh, parents should do these things with kids who are having difficulty in concentration. When they are friendly and supportive, praise them, give a lot of positive attention. 
When you want to say something, go to their eye level, get their eye contact, be simple and short. If they complete a task, face them highly. When they complete tasks like homework, eating their meals, establish a reward scheme and give them things they like. If they do not follow your instructions, remove things they like temporarily so they will learn the consequences. So becoming too friendly with them may be harmful. You need to be authoritative. That means be parents with enough control, establishing clear behavior limits without unnecessary permissive nature. We frequently give medications for children with ADHD. These medication has been used in the world over for decades and they are very safe. Even though many people are scared of these medications because they are prescribed by psychiatrists, it is not so in the developed world. One of the frequent medications we prescribe is called methylphenidate. It is very effective and it sometimes can cause minor side effects like uh, upper gastric uh, symptoms, weight loss, loss of appetite, and sometimes poor sleep. If those symptoms are troubling the child, we can easily shift to a different medication. In the longer run, they are quite safe. Rarely, they may lead to weight loss. When that happens, we usually change the medication to something else. In Sri Lanka at the moment, we do not have the prolonged release version, which is much easier to take. We usually have the immediate release version only. When children do not tolerate stimulants are not responding, we use non-stimulants like atomoxetine and conidine. They cause less appetite loss and sometimes more tolerable than methylferidate. So all these medications are used by millions of children in the world and do not cause major side effects and most of the time safe. However, they are known to cause uh, upper GI symptoms. In that case, sometimes we need to adjust the meal times, ask them to take the tablet just after a meal and uh, change the medication if they become intolerable. So how do the medication work? So as I said before, the dopamine transporter works too much, removing too much dopamine from the synapse. So the methylphenidate goes and blocks the dopamine transporter. So dopamine is available for the child to maintain concentration on their schoolwork. So this is a video, obviously an animation, but the voices in this video are of true children. That means actually children who are on treatment for ADHD have spoken here. Let's listen to children who have taken treatment, how they feel about it. So, what's it like to have ADHD? Some people daydream or find it difficult to concentrate. Others feel angry. Sometimes you just want to go out and lash and lashing out at them. It's like your heart starts, you know, it just, your body starts to get into it, really rough and like hot and all that. It's like, feel like it's all like really like, aggressive. It's... So he feels aggressive like a human volcano. Exactly. But doesn't that mean he might be in trouble a lot or might feel bad about himself? Yes, but some people with ADHD don't feel like that at all. Some daydream. So do you feel like you can't pay attention very well? Only when I'm taking the test. Mm. I get distracted. I'm like... Mm. Then I'm off in my own little world. <laughs> <laughs> What's yeah. it like in that world? Fun. I get to draw, paint, do whatever I want. Ah. And, and, I, and I also get to buy my own dog. It sounds like a lovely world. Why, why do you think it's a problem? Because I don't get my work done. So, she was daydreaming, which sounds fun, but means she's not concentrating on her schoolwork. Right. And focusing is a problem for some people. 
whether they daydream or not. The worst problems I really have involve like schoolwork and like not being able to finish classwork before the other students. What they do in my math class is when we're done with the test, our teacher will ask us and she'll tell us to raise our hands if we're not finished and sometimes I'll end up being the only one in the classroom and everyone will kind of stare at me. So he struggles to concentrate. Whoa! That's right. And some people feel like they're on the outside, that things are out of their control. Like, I say stuff that I don't even, like, know why I said that. And then a couple minutes, like, wow, did I just really do that? I can't believe I did that. So ADHD can feel different to different people. Yes. And that's why it's difficult to tell who has it. Does medication turn me into a different person? So, if I had ADHD, would I have to take medication? Perhaps. You might have heard of one of them. Ritalin. And how much would the medication change me? Some people think it can change you a lot, even into a different person. But it's not actually like that. Okay, so would the medication give me space to stop and think? That's a nice way of putting it. Would you say that when you take your medicine, it changes you? It's a bit of both, really, because I'm a bit the same person I always am. Hmm. I act a bit different, but I'm always, I actually are always the same. I am always the same person. No, I'm just the same person I am, yeah. Just mm. almost a better version. Well, I don't think they'd be better, but they just remind that part of my brain to work. Mm. That bit's already there, but then that just reminds it ah. to do its job. But it's not that different, you're still the same person, but okay. you just act a little better. Medication will help you control yourself. When you take your tablets, because do you feel like you're a different person? Not really, yeah. No, it's just, I'm the same person. It's just, I just behave differently. So the medication wouldn't turn me into a different person. Exactly! It's tricky for children with ADHD because they have to learn to follow the rules, but they also want to be free, to be themselves. Oh. <sighs> Sounds like a difficult balance. It is. That's why kids need lots of support when taking medication, so they feel they can be themselves. And doctors and parents can help by talking about it with them. What does Ritalin do? So, what exactly does Ritalin do? It affects certain chemicals in the brain and can help control some of the symptoms of ADHD. Is that a good thing? Can that really help? It helps people in different ways. It can help them to focus, to control their attention, and it can help them to stop and think before they act. Well, some people have ADHD and they're like, like my mate who has got it, he's, um, got severe and he's always like hyper even when he's took his tablet but he's like a lot calmer when he's took him. Mm, it makes me like helps me behave better but it don't make you behave better can only help you but it can make help make like better decisions so what does the medication do? It gives them a space to think before they act and understand consequences of what they say, what they do. So uh, I have, uh, in many countries we have work, usually uh, medications for ADHD is not started in the primary care, but it could be followed up in the primary care because uh, most of the medications for ADHD are under special regulations. It is not advisable to start them in primary care. It is better to be started by a child psychiatrist because there's always a psychiatrist for each district. Always better to refer for the initial consultation and the beginning of medications. Uh, most of the time they are much safer. They can give minor side effects. Then you can change the medication to something else. Uh, so, uh, it's better to uh, get the specialist consultation for the init initiation, then maybe uh, you can consider following up the patient depending on the available facilities and availability of child psychiatrics. So, as in the primary care, how can we help children with attention deficit disorder? Tell them this is a delay in the neural networks controlling concentration with evidence-based treatment 
the child will improve and their studies and uh, functioning will improve. If possible, ask them to go see a child psychiatrist. If not, at least ask them to go see a psychiatrist. Psychiatrists conduct a clinic specially for children and they will definitely help. Teach them parents differential reinforcement. Differential reinforcement is giving child attention when they are pleasant, helpful and supportive and ignoring them when they are this, uh, when they are angry and not following your instructions, rather than blaming the child, yelling the child, much more effective way is giving differential reinforcement, focusing on good things and ignoring not so good things. They should be allowed to have remedial teaching. What is remedial teaching? Most kids with ADHD have good intelligence. But because in the class with 40 other children, they get distracted. So at home, one-to-one -one attention, a calm environment, shorter tasks with adequate intervals can do a lot of help. Also, they may be allowed to get special help with tutors for certain subjects because in one-to-one -one help, they improve very well. So thank you very much for joining and listening to me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chandra Dasan. We do have a couple of questions, but I believe you've answered both questions in the course of this lecture. But uh, just for the sake of completion, I'll just uh, read them out. The first is, in the case of medication, is there any serious side effects to the child? Right. Uh, so these medications are used by millions of kids in the world have been there for decades and they are known to be very safe only because they are stigmatized because we prescribe them because we are psychiatrists. Uh, otherwise, uh, no person will have any problem because uh, children, uh, when they take it, they improve. Most of the time they improve. If they get side effects, nothing to be afraid of. Like they get uh, difficulty in eating, loss of appetite, you change to a different medication. So they are much safer and uh, you can go to PubMed and read. There are so many systematic reviews and meta-analysis saying these medications are very safe and in the long run, they do not cause serious side effects. Thank you, sir. And again, uh, the second question also, I believe you have answered. Uh, it says, according to protocols, can primary care physicians start on methylphenidate and then refer to a child psychiatrist? Yes, uh, so because uh, methylphenidate is under special regulations, it comes under different category. It is not advisable. And uh, in other countries also I have worked, uh, usually I have not seen primary care physicians start in this medication. Uh, so it is advisable for the special first consultation, refer to an expert because uh, there is a gen uh, consultant psychiatrist in all districts in Sri Lanka. Thank you, sir. And there are many requests uh, for you to share the slides, if at all possible. And um, if there are no other questions, uh, may I please remind everyone about the feedback form and the questions. Uh, the link has been posted in the chat box. Uh, yes, we have an, another question. Can methylphenidate be given for patients with epilepsy? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Can methylphenidate be given? in epilepsy? Uh, so if the child has uncontrolled epilepsy or new ones of epilepsy, methylphenidate have a tendency to lower the threshold for seizure. <coughs> then we usually avoid methylphenidate, <coughs> especially because <coughs> in Sri Lanka, we only have the immediate release version. However, if a child has had epilepsy, now have good control on anticonvulsants and we have tried non-stimulants and failed in improving the concentration in lower doses we may give stimulants but uh, uh, overall if there is uncontrolled epilepsy we tend to avoid uh, stimulants but however more systematic reviews are showing that it's not not very dangerous and uh, can be given in certain situations, even when the child is having epilepsy, but on anticonvulsant. 
Thank you, sir. One last question. I believe this is regarding a patient who shows slow processing of information and showing an intellect that does not match the age. Uh, the question is, do these features uh, correlate with autism spectrum disorder? So slow processing of information, that means a lower working memory and intellect that doesn't match the age. That means the higher order thinking less than the chronological age is more suggestive of intellectual developmental disorder. Intellectual development disorder after diagnosis can be helped with remedial education. And sometimes if they have comorbidities like inattention, they can be supported with medications and they can be improved. However, if a child has intellectual disability, uh, we may not be able to get them to the same level as the other kids. But however, there are other avenues like vocational training, special pathways of education that can support these children. Thank you, sir. One last question. Uh, is there a role of risperidone in treatment of ADHD? So in ADHD, uh, the stimulants and the non-stimulants I mentioned are the first line uh, or the first and second line medications. But however, in Sri Lanka, due to the economic crisis, most of these ADHD medications were out of stock. So we had to go into third line and fourth line medications. Well lower, certain second generation antipsychotics like Resperidone has good evidence for attention deficit hyperactivity, especially when there are significant comorbidities. No child with ADHD has pure ADHD. They have oppositional defiance symptoms. That means they argue, they annoy the parents, they do not follow the instruction, they do opposite of what is asked. Some have tick disorders that are jerky movements. Some may have aggressive behavior. When there are certain comorbidities, uh, the usual ADHD medication is not suitable for them. So there are other medications that we use when there are comorbidities apart from ADHD. So uh, there are no kids with only ADHD. Almost all of them have comorbidities that need separate treatment. Thank you, sir. We do have some questions rolling in. Please bear with us. Um, one of the questions is, what is the best age to start medication for ADHD? So the international recommendations, especially UK guidelines say children above five years can be started on methylphenidate. So uh, in children below five years, behavioral therapy uh, is given more prominence and medication less so. After five years, medication is given a more prominence and uh, also they can be supported with behavioral interventions and academic intervention. So five years is the usual age we start with stimulant medication. However, certain children, even at nursery, their hyperactivity is so harmful and so threatening to others, sometimes they are removed from the nursery or they have caused significant aggression to their siblings. In that case, to allow them to have a normal relationships, develop normal friendships and have a fun time at school, we may start certain medication, not methylphenidate, even below five years. That will depend and that will depend on after a, after an extensive assessment. Thank you, sir. What are the effects of stopping methylphenidate after using it for a long time? Uh, there's actually no effect. Uh, one of the commonest uh, complaints by parents is that, let's say the child's inattention was uh, like, okay, let's say a child's attention was 40% before starting methylphenidate. Child took the methylphenidate for three months and they will say, okay, the attention went from 40 to 70%. When the child was taking methylphenidate, he was, to do, was able to do some academic work. When the methylphenidate stopped, they frequently come and say to us, uh, it used to be 40%, now it's actually 30%. It is worse than before that, but it's actually not true. This complaint from parents uh, have been recorded from all over the world, it will go back to 40%. However, what the systematic review says, if you continue methylphenidate at least for two years, that allows the child to at least improve to the next level. For example, if the child was heading 
towards ending his academic work just after O levels, these two years may allow him give the learning skills for him to go beyond O levels, maybe go for a diploma. So, uh, usually in Sri Lanka, because most of the parents and even doctors are scared of these medications, what we say is, uh, be kind to your child. The child needs this medication, at least give it for two years. But we prefer if the child could be treated from grade one, maybe up to grade five or six, so they can gain the essential learning skill. But usually, most kids after grade nine, 10, they do not want the medication and they can function well because most of the inattention improves slowly when they age. Thank you, sir. Uh, is Why do you always recommend that children come early before they are 12 years of age for treatment? Uh, did I say something specific about 12 years? I'm sorry, I'm not following that question. Um, maybe they are... Uh, uh, maybe this is an inquiry about uh, something you've said earlier, but uh, maybe we can sk skip that question then. Okay, uh, okay, I'll answer that. Probably something I said earlier. So not 12 years, actually uh, before six years. So if because now grade one, two, and three are the times that you need to uh, learn the basics of calculation, reading, and writing. In that important phase, even though the child may have attention deficit, because if they have higher intelligence, you may look like they are completing work, doing work, but actually at home they are not doing work. Because they are not learning perseverance, motivation, turn taking and tidiness. So uh, if they have features of attention deficit hyperactivity, if you think uh, they need help, it's better to try start treatment in grade one. Uh, when they turn 12 years and they have not taken treatment, most of the essential learning skills are all enemies. Even if we start treatment, uh, attention will still improve. But the scholastic skills they have missed over the years, it sometimes may be hard for them to catch them after 12 years. Thank you, sir. Uh, would you recommend that these children attend special schools or a normal school? Uh, so usually kids with autism spectrum disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity uh, should uh, attend normal schools because uh, if their intellectual levels are good, there's no need to go for a special schools. So we know 80% of children uh, usually can be helped in a normal school. Another 15% can still be helping the normal school with extra attention, supportive teachers, shadow teachers. Only 5% of children with uh, moderate to severe intellectual disability may need special education. Children with autism and normal intelligence are better at normal schools because they can interact with typically developing children and improve their social communication. Uh, thank you, sir. Is there a higher risk of a sibling developing autism if the first child was diagnosed with the same? So general population uh, prevalence of autism is 1%. But if the first born is a boy and the second born is a... There are a lot of uh, 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 studies. I will just briefly say, simplify, oversimplifying things. If the first born is a boy and the second born is also a boy, probably there is a risk of 3 to 6% of autism. If the first born is a girl and the second born is a boy, the risk of autism in the second born boy may be more than 9 to 12% like. But if the first born is a boy and the second born is a girl, the risk of autism in the second born is much lesser because autism is less in girls, so it may be like 3 or less than 3%. So it will depend on the gender distribution. Thank you, sir. Can the inattentive form of ADHD be managed effectively by non-pharmacological therapy alone? Uh, usually international recommendation, recommendation says if the child is above five years, it says uh, medications are recommended. That is the practice well over. 
But however, sometimes parents are so scared of the medications, they think giving medications, uh, they feel guilt about them. Uh, then rather than doing nothing, like if, if you don't like medications, that's fine, that's your choice. Uh, sometimes we feel upset because the all the medical evidence, all the research studies published in the world says to give medications. Still, sometimes parents do not want medication, so we feel upset at times. Uh, we should not. So in that case, uh, uh, if you don't like medication, it's, it's your right and it's your choice. But rather than doing nothing, at least you should uh, direct the child for remedial teaching uh, that will be helpful for the child. Thank you, sir. And there's another question. Is it possible to cure a child who is non-verbal? and severely autistic? Uh, autism, uh, I would say it's not an illness. It's something that you have to live with for a long years. So the word cure may be a difficult word to use. Maybe the word recovery, rehabilitation, functional improvement are more appropriate. Definitely all children with autism spectrum disorder, their functional levels can be improved, but require a lot of dedication from the parents and the therapists. Thank you. So there's another question inquiring whether methylphenidate causes aggression. Uh, the physician has started methylphenidate uh, uh, two weeks back but the child uh, for a child on the spectrum, but the child apparently gets more angry. So usually, methylphenidate, when given to children with autism spectrum disorder with comorbid inattention, can cause initial aggression. There is, this is so scary for the parents if the person who prescribed it didn't give a warning. So sometimes uh, when the child with autism is not focusing on therapy, is going to be expelled from school, we have to resort to giving a medication. So these medications temporarily can cause aggression in a child with a pervasive developmental disorder like autism. In that case, you may have to change the medication. Uh, thank you, sir. I believe this is the last question. And you answered part of this. If the child is on methylphenidate, how long do we need to continue the drug? And should it be taken continuously? Uh, even if the child misses certain doses or misses even for a couple of months, there's no major harm. Obviously, for the personality development, learning of new skills, learning to make friends, building self-esteem, if the medication is taken appropriately, continuously, it's much better. Because, for example, let's say on, on, the vacation, on vacations, he's not taking. But vacations are the time he builds up friendships with his cousins. So without the medication, he's knowing disturbing, irritable, the cousins do not want to play with him or her. So if you, if the child can take it continuously, it's much better. However, uh, if the parents do not want to give this or this medication are causing loss of appetite, it's okay to miss it for a couple of days. There's no major harm. Uh, however, uh, the time that the child should be on the medication is not very certain. But what we usually say in Sri Lanka is grade one to grade five. Sometimes children, uh, they pass scholarship very well. Uh, sometimes the child, him, him or herself, come and say, Dr. Uncle, can I please have the medication for another year? Because I, I have passed scholarship. I have gone to a big school and the competition is so tough. I want to take this medication. Sometimes they come and say, sometimes they come and say, Dr. Uncle, I think I can do my work without your medication. Let's stop it. So. Uh, when the children gets bigger, they understand the need for it. So if you allow enough autonomy for the child, they will discuss. Most of the time, parents, even though they are not happy to give the medication, most of the kids, they say, please give me the medication. When you give it, I have friends. I have good marks. Thank you very much, sir. Although the questions do keep rolling in, I think it's time to wind up uh, for the evening. Thank you very much uh, for uh, being our guest tonight. And any other questions, I think we will uh, reach out to you directly. And 
uh, clarify those questions. And to the audience, thank you very much for being active participants today. Any more questions you have, please direct to us and we will try to get them clarified um, by directing them to Professor Chandra Dasar. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening and please fill the form uh, for your CPD points. Thank you and have a good night. <laughs>